Welcome back, everyone, to episode five of our look at the First Crusade through the lens of extra history. As always, there's a link in the description that will take you back to episode one of my reaction, as well as to their episode five on their channel without my commentary if you want to see that. So I'm um, going to get right into this one today using a new webcam for the first time. So apologies if there are hiccups and adjustments that need to be made. It'll take me a few days and a few recordings to get everything kind of figured out. But let's go ahead and dive in to the siege of Antioch. After the Battle of Derylium, the way lay open to the south, towards Antioch, towards Jerusalem. But the Turks, though beaten, were far from broken. In their retreat, they stripped the land and laid waste to anything they couldn't take with them. And as the crusade moved south, the heat intensified. Kili Jarslan, the Seljuk Sultan, had ordered the wells along the path destroyed, and in the sun-scorched plains of Anatolia, thirst began to stalk the ranks of the crusade. So in some ways, this is kind of like um, biological warfare, right? Uh, we talked several times during this series already about how an army can only move as well as it can be supplied. And this is kind of brilliant in one sense, but also it's going to come back to haunt your people. Um, you know, the army can dig new wells. You're going to destroy wells. The army can dig new ones, but it's going to slow them down. It's going to keep them from being able to move as fast as they can. When I visited the, Freder or the uh, Chancellorsville battlefield last year, there's a spot where you um, you follow in the footsteps of Stonewall Jackson's famous flanking maneuver, that uh, all-day march that he took his corps around to hit the Union on their flank. And there's the spot where you actually drive through a creek that's running across the road. And there's signs there that say this is where Jackson's men stopped to get drinks, to fill their canteens. And even just doing that with water that was already there slowed them down because they had to stop and do that. And so, yeah, this is going to this is going to hurt your army. It's not going to probably kill anybody uh, if you can dig wells fast enough. Parched animals laid by the roadside to die. Men chewed thorns for moisture. Mm. The crusade left a trail of the dead. But finally, the crusade crossed into the fertile valleys of Iconium, where they restocked and made the trek across to Heraclea. Here, the Council of Princes met to discuss their next move. Two paths lay open to them. One dangerous but quicker through the Taurus Mountains, and the other a slower but less risky path over the confusingly named Anti-Taurus Mountains. <laughs> so this makes me think of a couple of different things. One is, of course, in Lord of the Rings, you have that famous decision. Do we go through the mines of Moria or do we go up and over the mountains? Um, but in history, uh, there was a situation, if you've ever heard of the Donner Party, which is that famous incident where this group of people who are traveling to the West during the gold rush uh, days of California uh, end up stranded in the mountains. And uh, some of them have to eat members of their own party, the ones who died. And in a couple of cases, actually kill people uh, to feed on. Uh, and all of that started because of going the wrong way, taking what was promised to be a shortcut and ended up costing them precious time. The majority of the army chose to follow the safer route, but Tancred and Baldwin set out on the harder trek. Adventure Tancred time. brought a few hundred knights with him, while Baldwin detached over 2,000 soldiers from his brother Godfrey's army for the adventure. Tancred's group set off first, and soon came upon the port town of Tarsus. After quickly driving the garrison back into the city, he realized he had a problem. So Tarsus, um, probably most famous these days uh, for being the hometown of the Apostle Paul, who wrote a lot of the books of the New Testament and the Bible. He was originally Saul of Tarsus, later takes on a new name, Paul of Tarsus. He had nowhere near enough men to take a walled city like Tarsus. So Tancred sent word back to his uncle Bohemond to send along reinforcement. But as the writer was heading back to the main force with the message, Tancred had a flash of brilliance. He quickly had his men surround the town and make it look like they were preparing for a siege. Then he sent word to the Turkish garrison that he was but the vanguard of an enormous force of crusaders who would soon sweep over Tarsus and do horrible things to any Turks defending its walls. Most of the Turkish garrison quietly snuck out of the town that <laughs> night. The rest <laughs> offered to surrender. Psychological warfare. So all of the elements that you see in modern warfare 
are present here. You've got biological warfare, trying to hurt uh, the enemy's ability to keep his army fed and healthy by destroying wells. Now you've got psychological warfare. You're using deception. You're using uh, false information to try and cause your enemy to react without knowing the facts. And when you're walled up in a city, you don't necessarily know what's going on out the, outside the city. During the morning. Now, you remember a couple episodes ago how Tancred had managed to slip through Constantinople without swearing an oath to the Byzantine Emperor? Well, the garrison flew Tancred's banner over the town, and he declared it his city. Oh boy. This lasted all of about 15 minutes before Baldwin arrived. Baldwin, who was much less concerned with subtlety, and apparently oaths, saw the banner and basically said, Hey, what a fabulous idea. I love it. But I have 2,000 men, so why don't you let me have that city instead? Tancred grumbled under his breath about how he had both beaten back the garrison and tricked them into abandoning the city, but he couldn't really fault Baldwin's logic. Live by the sword, die by the sword, right? You know, if you win it with a few hundred men and somebody else comes along with 2,000 men, sorry. 2,000 was indeed more than a few hundred, so he packed up his camp and grumpily started to head east. With Tancred gone, Baldwin's banner now flew over the city, but guess who shows up? The reinforcements Tancred had sent for before coming up with that ruse to take the city. Now, these men must have been a little miffed to have trekked all that way for nothing, but Baldwin, never a very secure man and never one to miss an opportunity to add insult to injury, refused to even let them into the city for the night, instead forcing them to take camp outside the city walls. Then, to add real injury to insult to injury, remember how the Turkish garrison had slipped out in the middle of the night? Well, they were still out there, and in the middle of the night, they descended on the Crusaders camped outside the walls uh. and slaughtered them as they slept. Those Turks really got a lot done at the middle of the night. So if they had been let in, different story. So here again, you have people who are supposed to be on the same side, but man, when greed and selfish interests get involved, it's every man for themselves. And, uh, you know, this is, this is where coalition building, you know, people take for granted alliances and coalitions and things like that. It's a lot harder to put together a coalition and hold together a coalition than people realize. And that's why when it's done well, the people who make it happen should get a lot of credit for that. People like Dwight Eisenhower, uh, people like George Washington, who leads a coalition force in the Revolutionary War. Uh, it's not easy to do those things. Bunch of night owls. As you can imagine, when the town woke up and saw a few hundred dead crusaders outside, well, no one was very happy with Baldwin. In response, he heroically locked himself in a building and refused to come out until people calmed down. Tancred, meanwhile, was off conquering the next town. This time, though, when Baldwin caught up and arrived outside the walls, things went nope. a little differently. Tancred had augmented his force with local Armenian volunteers, and by the time Baldwin showed up at this new city, Tancred was well entrenched inside the city walls. So, when Baldwin asked to be let in, it was Tancred's turn to say, mm, nah, I think you get to sleep outside. But, not content with letting Baldwin get off so lightly after letting their compatriots die, some of Tancred's knights ended up charging Baldwin's camp, and the Crusaders started a brawl outside the newly conquered city. And then, Baldwin basically wandered off and abandoned the Crusade. Baldwin headed east. He met an airless king. He got the airless king to adopt him. He promptly let the airless king be assassinated. He ordered the man who introduced him to said king, who was theoretically his friend, to be tortured to death, and he declared himself Count of Edessa. And thus, the first crusader state is born. So let's go a little bit more in depth on this one. So this is the guy here, uh, Thoros of Edessa, uh, that was the Armenian ruler of Edessa uh, before Baldwin takes over. Uh, and you can see here, Baldwin of Boulogne had come to Edessa rather than participate in the siege, uh, probably looking to carve out some territory for himself. Uh, he had captured Turbessel. Thoros invited him to Edessa and made an alliance with him in February 1098. Baldwin gradually convinced Thoros to adopt him as his son and heir. But having done this, Baldwin attacked Thoros' officers and besieged him in the citadel. Thoros agreed to let him have the city and made plans to flee with his family, but shortly afterwards, on March 9th, Thoros was assassinated by the Armenian inhabitants of the city, possibly on Baldwin's command, and Baldwin became the first count of Edessa. Two years later, he becomes the king of Jerusalem. Uh, now, not to be confused with the king in the film uh, that we've already talked about, um, Kingdom of Heaven, I think that's Baldwin the Fourth. 
Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, Edessa had once been part of the Byzantine Empire. Yes, Baldwin had sworn the oath. And no, he was not going to give it back. <laughs> and not to spoil future series, but he ends up becoming king of Jerusalem. Anyway, Tancred, meanwhile, rejoined the main crusade and captured a few more towns relevant to the effort along the way. When he rejoined, though, the crusade was a bit worse for wear. Male armor and mountain climbing don't mix, and the safer road through the Antitaurus Mountains had only proven to be slightly safer. At this point, they lost most of their horses to the heat and abandoned much of their armor in the mountains. And in front of them stood the great and ancient city of Antioch, a city founded under Alexander, made great by Rome, and fortified by Justinian. It was the last great obstacle between the Crusaders and Jerusalem. But the massive walls constructed by Justinian were too much for the Crusaders. The walls, which flew off from the city like wings high into the mountains, made the city impossible to encircle. So walls built by Justinian, who uh, is a Roman emperor, uh, are now coming back to hurt the very people who claim to be the descendants of that uh, empire, uh, fighting on behalf of that empire. The massive stones and impressive towers Justinian's mid had built were more than these crusaders could breach. So the crusaders decided on a plan, albeit one of the oddest siege plans I've ever heard of. They were going to have contingents blockade most but not quite all of the city's gates, which would seem to defeat the point of a siege, but some of those gates lay high atop the nearby mountains, and others lay behind a river which would split the crusaders' forces, so the crusaders decided to simply block what gates they could and wait. But as the weeks and then months passed and fall turned into winter, the crusade began to starve. The local area was stripped bare, so any foraging party would have to go far afield and risk being ambushed if they were to resupply the army. All throughout history, until re very recent history, uh, the two things that will doom an army quicker than any defeat on a battlefield are disease and supplies. And again and again and again we say it. You can't feed your army. You can't keep your army together. And if you're camped in one place for too long, you're going to deal with disease. You know, normally what you're trying to deal with in a siege is starve out and cause disease in the people being besieged. But in this case, it's happening to the army, too, that's besieging. So the princes decided on a daring plan. Bohemond and Robert of Flanders would take a sizable part of the army with them to forage in force, while the remnants of the Crusader army would try to maintain the siege. So Robert and Bohemond headed off, but as their foraging party reached the tiny village of Albara, what did they see? A large Muslim army marching down the very road to Antioch they were heading up to forage. Mm. The Muslim force was as surprised as the Crusaders, and after a few minutes of everyone just blinking at each other in shock, the Crusaders, though outnumbered and laden with forage, charged. When the dust cleared, many were dead on both sides. There was no clear victor, and the Crusaders had lost all the forage they'd set out to acquire. But, in one of the strange twists of luck that accompanied the First Crusade, the commander of the relieving Muslim force, who was never that into being a relieving force, looked at the casualty list and decided, well, so much for that, and packed up his army and went home. Wow. Antioch's reinforcements were gone. The Crusaders were still starving, though, and that's not all. Think about how many times in history the history changes on luck, on decisions that at the time don't seem like they matter like sending a foraging army out who happens to run into the relief force and so instead of the relief force showing up and fighting your main army and maybe relieving antioch they get driven off uh you know things like that in the american civil war robert e lee gives orders to his army and, and somebody loses those orders wrapped around cigars and so McClellan gets word of what's happening and con concentrates his forces. Um, you know, people getting killed in uh, a freak accident that changes the direction of things. Uh, and World War I uh, breaks out because uh, of dominoes that fall uh, because of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which only was successful because his driver took a wrong turn down a dead-end street. Stuff like that. There were earthquakes and comets, even auroras, and crusaders were generally the superstitious type, so after seeing all that, a lot of them began to slink off and abandon the crusade, including none other than Peter the Hermit. Bishop Ademar quickly hauled some of these recalcitrant crusaders back to Antioch, including Peter, and then followed up with a brilliant plan. He called for a fast to regain the favor of God, which is a pretty clever way to improve morale and solve your supply problems. At long last, and much worse for wear, the Crusaders made it through to spring, and the food situation started to improve. And then Bohemond got tricky. 
He convinced the leader of the Byzantine contingent that there was a plot to kill him. When the Byzantines reacted by going back to Constantinople, Bohemond accused them of cowardice and abandonment, mm. treacherous behavior which he claimed freed him of his oath to Emperor Komnenos. Wow. Now How convenient, all of those things. This is a tricky guy. I mean, there's any number of ways in which a plan like that could go wrong. What if they say, no, we're not going? What if they go, but nobody believes you? when you accuse them of cowardice and there are witnesses who say, no, I, I heard him say that they should go. I heard him tell them these things. You know, there's so many ways this could have failed. Now, with another Turkish reinforcing army bearing down on the crusade, he threatened to abandon the siege of Antioch unless he was allowed to keep the city when they took it. Godfrey and Raymond grumbled about this, but there was only so much they could do, as the lesser knights loved Bohemond. You have to give Bohemond some credit, though, because after this, he proceeded to lay out and execute a plan that not only thrashed the second Turkish relief army headed for Antioch, but also inflicted a great number of casualties on the garrison. And thus, the siege survived to drag on into summer. Then the Turks assembled a third great army to relieve Antioch, this one far too large for the Crusaders to meet in open battle. But Bohemond hadn't spent the months idly. He managed to find a guard commander in the city who was bribable. And just before the arrival of the Turkish army, the bribed commander let the crusaders over the walls in the uh. dead of night. The massacre was horrific and indiscriminate, but by dawn, with many civilians amongst the dead, the crusaders had captured all of Antioch except the citadel, which stood atop a mountain at the end of its long walls. Join us next time as the besiegers become the besieged, as we witness the epitome of horror, and as, at last, the crusaders make it to Jerusalem. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how this story concludes, and uh, we'll definitely be diving into more uh, videos about the Crusades down the road. Uh, this is not a one-time thing. It's a period of history I don't know nearly enough about, and I'm excited to learn more and more. I've learned a ton already. I hope you have too. Let me know your thoughts if you have something to add to what we've already talked about. If this is an area you know a lot more about than me, for example, uh, which I know a lot of you are out there. We all have different areas of interest where we spend a lot of our time. So let us know your thoughts. Add to the conversation down below. Thanks for watching.